or seven innovative ways to measure, manage, and improve service levels. I'm Frank Days, Vice President of Marketing here at CoraSense, and I'm going to be your host today for this webinar. Um, you can go to the next slide here. I'd like to introduce our guests, our guest speakers for today. First of all, uh, kicking off the presentation will be Phil West. He's the CIO of Gaines Co. Insurance. Um, Phil has over 20 years of experience in the non standard insurance industry and from talking to Phil I learned a pretty interesting fact about him that he actually is an avid musician and uh, he, he spends a lot of time playing both the saxophone and piano when he's not trying to solve and troubleshoot uh, network performance issues. Next is uh, after that, after Phil kicks it off, Dan Youngst, uh, VP of Solution Engineering here at CoralSense. Um, he brings with him over 12 years of experience in the application performance management market and uh, in his spare time, he enjoys playing soccer in his quest to return to his World Cup form. Before we get going on the presentation itself, I just wanted to go through a couple of housekeeping items, keep it really simple for us uh, as we do this. First of all, we're going to try to shoot, I know we booked this uh, whole session for about an hour, but we're going to try to shoot to make it last about 30 minutes, followed by a basic Q&A. So if you do have a question along the way, feel free to submit that question via the chat window on the GoToWebinar. Um, and we'll stop periodically if the question's in the middle at logical stopping points to answer them. Uh, also, we will be making the slides available to everyone via SlideShare, and the, the presentation will be recorded uh, and posted on the CoralSense blog uh, later on, just in case anyone couldn't make it today, if any of your colleagues couldn't be here today. Well, with that, let me hand, oh, let me look, I'm oh, sorry, let's go to the next slide. It's a quick brief preview of the agenda. For, again, I just went through the background section. The next thing we're going to talk about, which is the meat of the presentation, seven, seven best practices, which Phil is going to share with us. Finally, Dan's going to tie it together with a demo to try and show some of the things, some of the specific Coral Sense products, which relate to the presentation that, Dan's, uh, that Phil is talking about in, in his best practice slides. And finally, we'll tie it up at the end with some Q&A. And now, without further ado, let me hand the presentation over to Phil. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, my name is Phil West, and uh, let me uh, give you a little bit about uh, the background, uh, the lead up to us implementing the CurlSense product. Our web portal is our main uh, source of um, income. It's where our independent agents go to transact business with us. And uh, a few years ago, we went through a pretty significant modernization project, getting to the latest .NET framework, doing some data normalization on our back-end um, databases, uh, getting cross-browser compliance that we didn't have before, and really uh, redesigning some of the underlying architecture components. It was about a you know 12 to 18 month uh, development project for us, really just bringing an application um, up to date technically. Uh, so that was uh, significant for us in a lot of ways. Um, from a supportability standpoint, from a ease of maintenance, and, and a lot of other things. Um, you know, subsequently we launched. Everything seemed okay, um, and, and we found that we were having uh, quite a. If you'll go to the next slide, um, quite a bit of uh, um, issue with uh, performance. And um, we are we, we do not have a real load testing tool in our environment. You know, good load testing tools are pretty pricey. Um, uh, you, you know, so thing, things that seem to be functioning well in our testing and QA environments, when we hit production and got under load, uh, we just found that we were having some pretty significant issues. Um, kind of the traditional ways to track those down via you, you put in some traps in the code and you're, you're into this vicious cycle of making code changes, testing them to make sure you didn't break things and make them worse, deploying them to production, trapping information. You hope you got it in the right spot. You hope you found something, maybe not. Um, then go through that cycle over and over and over. So um, we were kind of in that cycle there and just not getting the answers that we needed to track down um, the issues that were manifesting themselves in our production environment. And it was pretty painful for a, a matter of several weeks. Um, uh, ultimately, we implemented the um, 
CurlSense SharePath tool, and uh, really the implementation went pretty easy, um, and we were able to pinpoint very quickly uh, what amounted to some very serious inefficiencies in the entity framework uh, that we had just implemented. Um, as part of the EF model from Microsoft, it just was not running well. And all of our SQL Server database calls were really the culprit of our performance issues. Um, but rather than have, having to interject uh, trapping points and, and all that kind of stuff into our code, we found that we were able to um, simply install agents in our web, for, web farm and all the different nodes and it's sort of collecting information, very detailed information that drilled us down, uh, frankly, right to the SQL statements that were, were problematic and we were able to pretty quickly identify that we needed to move away from the EF, uh, the entity framework implementation and back to a direct access methodology for database calls. Uh, once we identified that, it was literally with some of those changes, um, you know, once we knew where to work, uh, a matter of hours to get them changed and to start getting some relief into our production application. Um, uh, the key thing being that we weren't having to get into code to, uh, you know, put agents within the code. It could sit on the web, uh, on the web farm. We've got 10 nodes in our web farm and it's a simple matter to get the agents on each one and have them collect information and send it back to a central reporting server. Um, so that's kind of the story on um, where we came from, how we, how we um, found a need for this tool and, and how it helped us through that um, very significant crisis that we were having, uh, and, you know, and then how we use it today. I, we continue to use it every day. It's a very critical component of our ongoing monitoring. I myself keep it up every day as do my infrastructure guys. Um, and, it, and it tells me a lot of different things. Um, but as we go through the um, kind of a, the, the seven benefits, number one, the thing that we've started to formalize around um, is looking at the deltas uh, for pre and post um, promotion. So while we still don't have a, a load testing tool, uh, we can implement SharePath in our QA environment and get a better uh, understanding of what the changes to our application has done to transaction performance time. Um, and, and then we can put it in production and do some pre and post analysis to make sure that we have not negatively impacted our production environment with the latest set of changes. We actually have formalized and do this now with every uh, major release. You know, we have a lot of, for uh, in the insurance industry, we do a lot of what we call rate changes, which are not really application changes. So we don't run this on that, but any major code release we do this on, and we take a look at um, the uh, how the application might be behaving differently as a result of the latest uh, code implementation, and, and it keeps us on our toes there. Um, SLAs, we are very keen on SLAs, as I'm sure uh, many people are. Uh, what we have found is that um, the, the graphical kind of bullseye target that you see there, if you set this up right, it can be very helpful to tell you how you're doing at a glance. And it's important we learn kind of the hard way not to set your SLAs to what you want them to be um, ultimately, but um, to set them at a reasonable level for how your application is operating today and then to analyze the information that it's giving you so that you can target where you want to spend your time improving performance. Otherwise, you know, we found that we were just uh, getting a lot of false positives, if you will. We had a lot of things that were blowing through thresholds just because we had over-aggressively set SLAs. Um, you can get pretty granular on the transaction types that you, that you choose for monitoring. Uh, so it, you know, it takes a little bit of planning and, and foresight into what you're trying to capture, what you're trying to do. Um, we tend to lump our, our our transactions into a couple buckets to help us categorize. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I can look at this and tell, you know, I can tell right now with my application that it's performing and within the bounds of acceptable performance. Uh, generally what our transaction load is out there um, on the site right now. 
um, and per transaction how you know, how my transactions are performing. Um, number three, you know, for going beyond um, the load testing, you know, I talked a little bit about how we uh, yeah. implement this in QA environments and we can measure the transactions at a more discrete level to make sure that, you know, now that we've got a baseline normal, if I'm doing something uh, that's changing or increasing or doubling a transaction uh, time frame, I have to take that into account before I go to production and make sure that um, that's going to be acceptable or I have to watch it very closely when I do go to production. Um, in order to get around some of the, you know, some of the fact that we don't have a load testing tool, but I have that information available to me now so that I can um, look at those deltas, understand what my changes have impacted in my application um, at a very discrete level because those tiny discrete things add up when you start spreading them out over hundreds or thousands of transactions. Um, so while we don't have a load testing tool, this um, the share path tool helps us bridge a little bit of that gap. Um, you know, it's not a substitute for a load testing tool, but in lieu of one, it, it does help us to close that gap a little bit of things that we don't know before we go to production. Uh, number four, uh, we have a topology map, and with our environment, uh, as with, with most out there, especially with web applications, when you have a tiered uh, architecture, you've got communication between a lot of different components. We are able to see real time how servers are communicating back and forth amongst each other within our infrastructure for the application. So at a glance, the network guys that monitor this can tell if they're getting acceptable performance between a, a database and a web service tier or a front end um, interface tier and a you know middleware brokering tier or we have an AS400 in our mix. We can tell what, what's happening to transaction times between the AS400 and maybe the SQL Server database. Uh, it's really a very helpful at-a-glance tool on is your infrastructure topology performing the way you expect it to be performing. And if it's not, uh, once again, you can set up thresholds and alarms that uh, tell you in a variety of different ways that you've got a problem. Uh, so the, 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 top, the live topology is very useful. Uh, moving on to the desktop response times, uh, as we know, the, the, the response times we see in the data center don't always coincide or correlate to what someone sees on their desktop. Um, we do use the, the, the desktop measuring tool on occasion to really see how the application is performing out on someone else's browser. Now, we always caveat our business users with the fact that we don't control what else may be running on someone's desktop out in the field. We don't control their internet connectivity. Uh, but we can see through the uh, breakdown, and you'll see this in the demonstration, of how a transaction gets broken down into all its core component parts. So you'll see um, uh, network, uh, network access times. You'll see application tiers, database tiers, and all these various components. And you can start to pinpoint at a very discrete transactional level exactly where a transaction may have slowed down. Um, we tend to focus here at Gainsco on the, uh, on the data center side of it, being that that's what we can absolutely control. We look at the desktop side of it. We try to keep that in mind because it will give us um, insight into the fact that if screen rendering times are horrendous, it may be some, that we're sending too much content to that page. Those are things that we have to keep in mind as we design our applications and try to push content out to agents for information that we think they might want to have. Um, with the end, you know, at the end of the day, the application needs to perform pretty well. So the desktop response time is, uh, is an opportunity for us to get some insight that we wouldn't otherwise have or have to depend on an imperfect third party reporting their perception of whether things are fast or slow. Um, our, our model uh, here is we're very much uh, terminal based, terminal server based internally. Um, you know, our, our deployment strategy is that really everything needs to go into a browser. So at the end of the day, this is a pretty good tool for us to uh, continue to look at 
desktop response times, understanding the things that we can't control to influence, you know, making it good or bad. Um, but it's, you know, knowing is half the battle. So that's how we use the desktop response times. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you see all the components here that go into any single transaction, no matter how simple it seems. It, you know, may have ten stops along the way. It, you know, four different tiers. Um, between the topology and the uh, level of detail you can drill into with the discrete transactions, you really get an idea of where your time is being spent. And it helps, especially for developers, for them to focus on the right aspect of a given transaction. So, you know, a transaction may be ten different steps, and without knowing which is the slow one, you, you're left with some imperfect measures to try to figure it out, or you just kind of take your best guess. This will tell you absolutely. Your slow part of this transaction is your database access, or it's in your web tier, or it's traversing between these two nodes on your network. Um, and it gets your guys to you know, spend their time focusing uh, on the part of the application or the transaction where you're trying to affect a change. Um, and that's a, that's a place in the past where we have struggled, thinking we're making changes that improve things to find that at, at best we didn't affect any change, and sometimes we've made it worse. Um, so, you know, part of that knowing where to find the needle in the haystack uh, is this tool pointing us in the right direction. Uh, the other, the, the last thing that we look at very regularly, and especially um, after a deployment, is we use uh, um, some of the reports in here, uh, primarily the top ten worst performing transactions. You know, so we'll pick a time frame. And we'll rank those transactions. And sometimes we're surprised by the things that are at the top of the list. But it tells us if we need to make things faster, exactly which transactions we need to focus on. And there's a couple different ways we look at this. Um, if you've got one transaction that occurs once a day and it runs poorly, and then you have something else that occurs a thousand times a day and runs, you know, OK, well, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the one a day transaction. But the thousand has an impact to a lot of people, so it really helps us to focus and not get wrapped up in, in the one-off call about this was slow or that was slow. When we can look at very um, concrete metrics that tell us this transaction is getting executed, um, you know, 20,000 times a day, and is performing at the edge of our acceptable SLA, and if we made it faster, it would make this experience better for that many people executing that transaction. And that's a huge thing because otherwise we're just guessing at what we need to do to make the application perform better. Or worse, we're responding to reports of it being slow when it's really running fine and it's just that uses experience as uh, just a one-off experience. You know, internet um, connectivities being what they are, there's always the one-offs and, and we investigate those but we have to take them into a grain of salt with a much bigger picture of all the different transactions and, and how many times they're being executed and how well they're performing against the SLAs we've established. So, you know, the top ten worst performing transactions is a critical report for us. It's one that we look at on a weekly basis, regardless of whether there's a deployment. Um, and we find that it's, you know, generally pretty consistent. The things that are on our top ten list right now are, have been there, you know, for the last several Mondays. And so we do something about them or, you know, choose to or, or not, um, they're going to continue to be there. If we see a change, then you know we'll start examining why there was a change. Do we need to focus on it? Just because it's on the list doesn't mean it's a poor performing transaction. It just means it's part of your top ten worst. So uh, you know it, it gives us the opportunity to have the right discussion about the right things um, with the you know real information as opposed to what users typically kind of report into you, which is you know all over the place sometimes. Um, and that's really, you know, kind of the seven different areas that we focus on and how we're using the tool. Like I said, I keep it up myself all day long, and it gives me a good indication of the number one of the non-IT aspect of just how much activity our sites at you know, the transactional level aspect of am I performing for the SLAs that I've published and set forth to the business that we're going to perform at. And that's Great. my... I probably talked faster than I, I normally do, but. 
Great. Well, thanks, Phil. That's really a great presentation. I think that's made some really compelling points about you know, thinking about th having the right data to have those discussions and uh, knowing where to focus, right? I imagine in your daily life you're extremely busy and there's a million fires springing up everywhere and just trying to make sure that you can understand which problems are truly problems versus while at the same time looking at uh, things the ability to identify problems maybe before they happen. I like that idea of the top 10 list of things that you can do. And then ultimately knowing what your true service levels. I think earlier in the presentation you said you guys have data, data center representations, but obviously those oftentimes are not, uh, don't always correlate with what your users are seeing out on their browsers. Well, with that, I wanted to hand, uh, hand the, the platform over to Dan Young. Stan's going to take a few minutes and do a demonstration of SharePath uh, Data Center Edition by uh, CoralSense to give you a sense of that you know, we had screenshots in Phil's presentation. Dan's going to take you through a, a troubleshooting example to give you a feeling of how the product actually works in real life. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Frank. Uh, yeah, and thanks, Phil, for that uh, interesting summary of how you use SharePath. I think that's uh, very interesting. So I do have a demo here. I want to walk people through it. It won't take very long, but I did want to just show you kind of some of the look and feel and show you some of the tools that, uh, that folks like Bill um, uh, use on, on a regular basis you know, in, when using SharePath. Uh, I've got the product running here on my machine and some data in it that I've loaded that will allow me to walk through a kind of sample problem scenario and how you might solve it. <clears throat> the first uh, orientation aspect of it is SharePath has a number of different dashboards that we can uh, provide to help you you know, understand the performance of your application. Uh, the first one is our SLA Watch dashboard, which is really where you can look get a, a first sense of what's the SLA performance of all your applications you're monitoring. In this case, we have these seven, um, or all the transactions that you're monitoring within those applications. So SharePath will automatically detect and monitor transactions uh, end to end, and we can apply an SLA for those, and then monitor the uh, transactions against the, um, those those SLAs so from a response time or a call volume standpoint. So when the response time begins to exceed the SLA, SharePath can alert you. Uh, you can have alarms and emails go out, um, or you can see it here in the dashboard. Uh, what's the SLA performance? <clears throat> this SLA watch view shows us the average response times. It shows us the call volumes of the transactions for all the transactions that we're seeing, and then we can group those into different applications, and then we can roll that data up to the application level so you can get the SLA performance and the um, response times at the applications as well. The data that I'm looking at here is for really the end user experience. So it's the desktop view, it's the desktop uh, service levels that we're looking at. Uh, SharePath also has the notion of applying service level levels at the data center level. So really it's the web server from the web server on back can have a service level defined for that explicitly as well. Um, so for sort of an SLA versus an OLA approach. So with the uh, data center SLAs, you can you, you can see the same kind of data, how are the transactions performing within the data center versus how are they performing, you know, how, how does the end user experience happening uh, for the end users. So I'm going to dive into one of these transactions and uh, walk you through some of the detail that we provide. I did want to show you um, another view, which is our topology view, and uh, Phil touched on this. It's a, a view that's actually dynamically built um, and automatically updated by SharePath. Uh, because we have our collection agents out there installed in your environment, so on the web servers here uh, and on the application servers, we put our uh, SharePath collection agents. And because they're out there, they begin seeing traffic and automatically stitching transactions together. And they automatically build this dashboard for you, showing you the topology. It's really a dependency map. It's like a real-time dependency map, if you will, of what's happening in your environment which uh, proxy servers are talking to which web servers, uh, how are the transactions flowing from a performance standpoint, and, and so on. So it can be very insightful in terms of giving you a quick sense of, of what's going on in your environment. And then from the uh, uh, top 10 slowest, 100 slowest transactions, uh, Phil mentioned this as well. This is one of the reports that he pulls up all the time, and uh, it's just that, that quick and easy to pull it up within SharePath. So I'm going to dive into some of these transactions and show you what they look like in detail, but this is just a quick listing of the top slowest transactions that we've identified uh, in this time period that we're looking at. Let me go back and look at We see that one of these transactions, wire transfer, is actually seems to be problematic on, in a couple of instances, a couple of slow wire transfer transactions. So let's go back and look at him in a little bit more detail. I've got him listed here right here in my SLA dashboard, and we see that he's got 88% SLA compliance. 
that means that 88% of the transactions have been fast enough to meet our SLA, but 12% have not. So there's 12% there of them are running slow. What I can do is pull up what we call a transaction profile for these transactions. Uh, for the wire transfer, transfer transactions for the day, for the time period that we're looking at, we see that it was activated 27 times. Uh, the average response time was four seconds, and the maximum was 22 seconds. So some of them were definitely running slow. Down at the bottom here, we see a little histogram showing you the actual invocations of the transactions, and we see there were in fact three slow ones um, that were far exceeding our SLA, which is this white line. This table in the middle in the pie chart actually breaks down an aggregate view of these. 27 transactions that show you where they're spending time uh, on average. So 60% of the time uh, of these transactions was spent in the mainframe, 18% in the data warehouse database, 9.69% uh, in the database. And I can further drill in and say which database queries you know, are we actually calling and how much time are we spending in those. So pretty good detailed data about the, the, this group of transactions, all 27 of these, and, and how they're performing and where they're spending time. But we do know still that we have these outliers, right? We have these three that are running slow. Um, so we may want to try to take a look and figure out what's going on with those. One of the comparison views that we can provide um, to, to look at deltas between things is this view called the SLA analysis tab, which shows us the, the difference between transactions that met the SLA, the green ones, and transactions that uh, exceeded the SLA, the red ones. So we see that breakdown in terms of the percent of time spent across the different tiers of the data center. Uh, again, remember we have our agents out there, so we're seeing the interaction of all the uh, different tiers and, and the transactions flowing through each of them. So we see the database and the warehouse gateway, and we see that a lot of time was spent in the mainframe here for the slow transactions. Uh, likewise, a number of calls. We see that uh, on all the tiers of the data center, the number of calls is actually the same between the fast and the slow transactions, but except for the mainframe where the slow transactions is called the mainframe 95 times. Uh, again, down here we see our three spikes of slow transactions. The next thing I can do is, just like pulling up that top 100 transactions, I can actually do a search and look for all the transactions of this type during this time period. Um, and I can sort um, on the response time. And now I see here's my top three slow ones that happened, and all the rest of them are around two seconds or, or less. But we see there's 19, 20, and 22 seconds. So these are our three slow transactions. I see the actual date and time they happened, the application they're a part of the data center response time and the browser response time. That could be you know, significantly different. Uh, and I see the client IP address. So where do these things actually come from? If I want to dive in and see what's going on in more detail, I can pull up the transaction view. And now I get a what we call our transaction tree, which is a it's one of our views for displaying a single individual transaction. Um, it, it shows us a kind of a step by step where this transaction went. It started at the, at the desktop, at the browser. I can actually see the total browser response time over here, 19.483 seconds, and that gets broken down into browser rendering time and uh, network latency going to the data center. Um, down here, the next stop here is the proxy server that we hit, and then we go on to the web server. And so we see how much time was spent in each tier and how much net time was spent on the network between tiers. Walking all the way down, we get to application server and then further down to the data warehouse gateway tier which is the thing that actually makes the 99 calls we see it here um, to the mainframe. So here's the mainframe being called. It's a CICS call, and it's an ATM8, and so we know exactly which CICS call, and we can um, see that there are a bunch of them calling the mainframe, also some MQ series, gets and puts, and some database queries. So we can actually get down to the detailed level about the actual database query. What was the select statement or the update or the stored procedure? Uh, which table was it hitting? Uh, what was the time to first byte, how many bytes were sent and received. So lots of very granular data about this one individual transaction. Now again, this is you know, one user hitting the application and the transaction that he experienced um, and what IP address he came from. We can also provide usernames uh, as, as well. So that's just a quick summary of um, how you can dive in and get the detail. Uh, what turned out to be the problem is um, in this application, it was a, a web application, it's a wire transfer application for transferring funds in a bank, and they, we can actually see the HTTP parameters that were passed in. The amount parameter for this wire transfer was $3.39 million, um, and that turned out to be the common characteristic of all the slow transactions. So they went back and looked and they discovered there was business logic in their application that said if they transfer over $100,000, go hit the mainframe, pull the full account history and attach it to the record, and go on about your way. 
which was great from an audit standpoint, but not so much from a performance standpoint. So all these 20-second transactions were their very high-dollar users. So in general, in summary, that's just a quick you know, uh, example of going from a high-level view of SLAs, uh, seeing the end-user experience from the desktop, uh, seeing the detailed data of the transactions going through the data center hop by hop and where they went, uh, seeing you know, which are the, your top offending transactions, um, and then drilling in into those transactions and kind of seeing what's actually happening, you know, what, what parameters are passed in, what response codes are coming back, uh, lots of good detailed data to help you both keep things up and running on a day-to-day -day basis and also solve problems when they happen. So, Frank, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Well, thanks, Dan. Thanks for that really informative example of how that particular financial institution was able to use SharePath to find that proverbial needle in the haystack. If we could roll back to the presentation, please. Well, I just want to remind people if they have any questions, please, please do feel free to post those questions on the chat window in go to webinar se session. Just waiting for the presentation to come back. But, um, if you're looking for more information about SharePath or anything that came to the presentation, please feel free to email us at info at CoralSense.com or check out a demo of the product at CoralSense.com. The other really great way to, to figure out whether CoralSense's products, SharePath, and our real user monitoring products is right for you is to actually take a download and try it. Uh, SharePath ROM is available, free, full function product, uh, is available via realusermonitoring.com or you can link to it from CoralSense.com. Again, on behalf of, looks like we don't, oh, we have one question that people are asking uh, before I jumped off the presentation. I guess this is a question either for Phil or Dan. What's the overhead of these agents? Yeah, so Frank, I can, I can take that and maybe go because this is uh, what we've seen as well, but it's designed you know, from a product standpoint, we're designed for production monitoring, so um, designed to be very low overhead, uh, kind of low single digit in terms of the CPU impact and no latency impact on the transactions, and we've worked very hard over the, you know, the past five years or so to keep that overhead low and, and, and make sure it is low. I would agree with that. Uh, we, we have not seen any... Um, detriment to transaction times as a result of these agents. Excellent. Great. I don't know that I see any other questions. Well, with that, uh, thank you, Phil, and uh, thank you, Dan, for joining us today. And again, if you, if you want to try it out, check out SharePath Real User Monitoring at realusermonitoring.com. And on behalf of everyone here at CoralSense, thanks for joining us today, and have a